welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. For the past few weeks, we've been looking at the book of Genesis. And as if you remember from when we started, the book of Genesis is really a book about origins and a lot of firsts how this world came to be and why the world is the way it is, how sin came to be and so on and so forth. It really is the history of the world, how it all began and the history of mankind. And it even reveals to us who God is and how he relates with people. Just by way of quick reminder, we we learned over the last few weeks that God created a perfect world. A world was that he called very good. And in everything that God created, it reflected his goodness. It reflected his glory. And we saw in chapter 2 how, of how God even provided for man the crown of his creation. Man who was created in the very image of God to, to glorify God, to image God in a very special way, unlike the rest of creation. How God provided Everything that man needed, including a companion, including uh, a, a wife, to rule and exercise dominion and reflect God's glory. Then we saw in chapter 3 how sin uh, destroyed everything, so to speak. That the man and the woman rebelled as a result of Satan coming and tempting the woman. And they rebelled and sinned against God and, and they became spiritually dead. And, they, and we see some sort of awakening in their life and particularly with Adam we saw that last week of how God had done a work and, and he responds in faith. And on top of that we saw how God still for their sin, God cursed the serpent and yet didn't curse the man and the woman. He gave them judgments or consequences or uh, temporal judgments uh, for their sin. And as a result, they are sent out of the garden for their own good so they wouldn't be locked in this sinful state. And now they have to live a life outside the garden, outside from being in that intimate fellowship with God, uh, outside of being face to face with God. Now they're, they're, they have to, they're barred from entering the garden and they have to live outside in the world with the consequences of their sin. And really the, the rest of the Bible and, and the rest of history is all about how man now lives in this sin-cursed world and how he can come back to God and have a right relationship with God. And that's what the rest of the Bible shows and the rest of the human history is all about. And today we are going to particularly look at Cain and Abel, two sons of Adam and Eve. And really, uh, as we look at verses 1 through 5, we're going to look at Uh, some details about them uh, under two headings. In verses 1 and 2, we'll just look at the setting that God has before us as they live in this sin-cursed world. And then in verses 3 to 5, we'll particularly look at the offerings that they bring uh, to the Lord. And we have much to learn here in terms of how to approach God and how it is that one can have a right relationship with God in this sin-cursed world. So firstly, let's just look at the, the setting that they're in, in verses 1 to 2. Let me just read verse 1, uh, first of all, verse 1. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, we don't know how much time would have passed from when they were driven out of the garden, but it's quite likely that it didn't take too long. 
We saw that Adam had a change in attitude toward his wife. And instead of blaming her, he was honoring her and, and, and believed that the promised seed would come through her and therefore named her Eve. We saw that last week. And after they were exiled out of the garden for their own good, the very next scene we see here is that Adam knew Eve, his wife. Now this word know or knew, we saw it in the last chapter that after Adam and Eve, they ate the forbidden fruit, they knew good and evil. In that, uh, what that meant was that, that they had intimate personal knowledge of evil by sinning and disobeying God. There was a personal knowledge now, a personal uh, intimacy with evil that they had now because they disobeyed God and by eating of that forbidden fruit. And now it says that Adam knew his wife. See, despite the fact that there is sin in them, sin in both Adam and Eve, because of the fact that Adam was now transformed by God and had showed evidence of faith, there's a degree of intimacy now between Adam and Eve. That they're no longer at conflict with each other. But there is a degree of intimacy once again. There is a degree of oneness once again in the marriage relationship. And one way in which this, this intimacy in marriage is expressed is, especially looking at the context, is through sexual intimacy. And that is what it seems to indicate here when it says that Adam now knew his wife. Within the context of that personal intimate relationship with his wife, there was sexual intimacy as well within this marriage relationship. And then it says that she conceived, meaning that she got pregnant, and bore Cain saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. You know, you can almost sense the, the excitement and, and hope in the words of Eve. See, in Genesis 2.23, the woman, Isha, uh, we saw that Isha came out from the man, Ish. Now, Eve, the woman, is saying, I've gotten a man. Me, the Isha, has acquired Ish. And this is exactly what God has said. Oh, the wonder and thrill of it all that, that Eve would have experienced. You know, they've, they've never seen anybody pregnant. They've never seen a child, a baby before. They've uh, let alone seen birth or anything of that sort. This is the first time in human history a human baby is born. So there's excitement there, there's, there's thrill, and even through all the pain of pregnancy and even child labor, the, the fact that she has a child, and, and that to a male child, she's, she's overjoyed and excited. Now, this is important, particularly the fact that she has a, a male child. Now, this is not because baby boys are in some way more better than baby girls. No, that's not true. Baby boys and baby girls are equally precious in God's sight, and equally they both bear the image of God. But Eve is particularly excited that it's a baby boy, but because remember, in Genesis 3.15, God said, Your offspring, he, a male, will crush the head of the serpent. This is what God had promised, a male offspring. That, and that male offspring would be the serpent crusher. In fact, in the original, Eve's comment should literally be translated, I have gotten a man, the Lord. There's big discussions in the translation world uh, of you know, how to make sense of it. So many of the translations have added this phrase, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. But it's actually not there in the, orig in the original. In fact, it's the same construction that's used uh, in the next verse, in verse 2, when it talks about the birth of Abel. 
So really it's better to take it uh, in terms of what it actually says, literally what it says, instead of adding uh, some of those other words. So Eve is literally saying, I have gotten a man, the Lord. Now I don't know if Eve knew that the, the, the promised offspring would be divine, but at the very least, she's acknowledging that this male child, this is the, the representative of the Lord. This is the man. This is the serpent crusher. See, Eve in naming Cain, she's expressing thrill and joy in having a baby. But at the same time, the fact that this child is a, is a male child, She's, she's saying that, oh, th this is the, the promised one, the representative of the Lord who's going to crush the serpent. In other words, like Adam, as we saw in Genesis 3.20 last week, Eve is expressing her faith in God. See, despite experiencing the consequences of her sin, Eve realizes uh, that God is just and good to do that and that even driving her away was from the garden was for her own good. And it was to remind her of the ruinous nature of sin to, to drive her back to God. And now she's showing that she truly loves God and trusts His Word. And, and, the, and that there is a hatred toward the serpent that he would be crushed exactly like how God said he would do. And remember, in Genesis 3.15, God didn't just say that this would come about. He didn't just say that, hey, Eve, uh, th there's going to be enmity between you and the serpent. He didn't just say somehow this would come about. No, God was even more specific. God said, I will do this. I will put enmity between you and the serpent. I will bring about a transformation in you. This is not just going to happen like that. You are not going to bring this about by your own effort. Remember, she was lost in sin and so was Adam. So God said he would bring this about. He would bring about this transformation. And that is exactly what we are seeing here. That transformation that God talked about and the, and the faith in God and love for God and His Word and a hatred for the serpent. Now Eve is mistaken about Cain, her, you know, her firstborn child. But nevertheless, what we can see is that she loves the Lord and believes his word and has faith just like her husband, Adam. See, Eve would not have understood that her children too would now be born with a sinful nature. The same nature that she got after she sinned. You know, one commentator says this, Eve's mistake was that she did not know that from sinful flesh, nothing could be born. And nothing could be overcome by corrupt sinful flesh. You see, Adam and Eve were created innocent. But then they chose to rebel and sin against God. And that innocent nature that they had was corrupted now. Now, after that, it became a sin nature. That their very nature changed. And every human being now that is born after them will be born with a sin nature. Dead in their sin, unable to see God rightly, unable to respond to Him right, rightly unless God intervenes. 1 Corinthians 2.14, here, uh, you know, it talks about the natural person. Now, the natural person is, uh, it's nothing but the unconverted person, a person who is dead in their sin. 
And so 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, this natural person has got two problems. When this person is dead in their sin, there's two problems. It says that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, doesn't accept the things of God. Why? For they are folly to him. And the second problem is this. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So the person who is dead in sin, this natural person, cannot understand the things of God because they see it as folly. On top of that, a person dead in sin is unable to understand. Now, Eve obviously didn't understand any of that. That our children, too, would now be born into a state of spiritual deadness. And there, would, there wouldn't be any change to them unless somehow God intervened. But nevertheless, at this point, she shows evidence of faith in God and His Word, even as she names her son, Cain. Now verse 2 says, And again she bore his brother Abel. Now some time has passed, and the next male child that Eve bears, she names him Abel. Now the name Abel is the same word for breath or a puff of air. Havel or Abel in English. It's a, it's a word that's used to describe the fleeting nature of things. And it's the same word that you will recognize in the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities. And what that talks about is the, the futility of life. You see, the, the longer Eve lived in the sin-cursed world and she began to experience more and more of the consequences of her sin, she began to see as sin had touched everything, nothing lasted. Everything was corrupt. Everything was decaying. Everything was dying. She saw the futility of life in this sin-cursed world as she realized these were the consequences of her sin. And so she names her second son, Abel, as a reminder of this futile life in this sin-cursed world. And in another sense, it was also pointing to the fact that Abel himself would have a short life. Now, verse 2 also gives us some more details about the kind of work that these two boys grew up to be engaged in. Verse 2 again, it says, Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. See, Abel, he looked after the domestic animals. In fact, the phrase in the original is actually, he's a keeper of the flocks. So most likely, he looked after all of the domestic animals. And now these animals would have probably provided milk. Um, but we should know that at this time, they were still eating vegetables for food. They didn't kill animals for food. That came only after the fall, and we'll see that God gives them that permission in Genesis 9. So they, at this point, they didn't kill animals for food. And, and Abel so just looked after the domestic animals. And this, if you remember, is, is part of the command that was given to Adam and Eve to, to rule over the animals. So it, it's part of that command that Abel is following. So it, it was a good thing that he was doing. Now Cain, on the other hand, was a farmer. He was a worker of the ground. And there was nothing wrong with this work either. Because remember, Adam was called to work the ground for food as part of living in the sin-cursed world now. And so now Cain is doing the same thing. So he's just doing what God had told uh, Adam to do. So both lines of work, they were, they were noble and good. 
So that's the, the picture of what life initially looked like outside the garden in the sin-cursed world. Adam and Eve showed that they had faith in God and his, and his word. And there was great hope and trust in what God had said. But at the same time, they experienced misery and turmoil and experienced the futility of life while they were living in the sin-cursed world, even by the name, naming of their second son, Abel. But still, God provided for them the means to get food uh, and, and even keep them safe. This was the life that God ordained for them. But then how did the next generation relate to God? You know, what was their relationship to God in this sin-cursed world? Because they, they weren't in the garden. They are born in, in exile in, in this sin-cursed world, just like you and me. How did they relate to God? Did they have a relationship with God? And now the focus shifts to their two sons, Cain and Abel. And here, particularly, we'll look at how they related to God in the offerings, in what they offered to God. And we come to our second point in verses 3 to 5. Verse 3. It says, in the course of time. Now, this, this phrase, in the course of time, it's not the idea of, oh, you know, just some undefined time had passed. It's a lot more specific. More literally, it, it reads, uh, at the end of days. So, a certain amount of days, and that day, those days have come to an end. It, it, it's the idea of a fixed amount of time. An appointed time had passed for them to bring an offering to the Lord. Now this is hinting at the fact that this was something that they did regularly at appointed times. See, God would have instructed them as to what to do uh, in how to approach God and, uh, and what kind of offering to bring to God and, and how to even approach God and worship God. And, and this is true even for the, uh, as we look at the rest of Scripture. You know, God very well defines how he needs to be approached, how he needs to be worshipped. It's never a man-made thing. It is always directed by God. God prescribes exactly how he is to be worshipped because there's a right way to worship God and there's a wrong way to worship God. See, God would have given these instructions to Adam and Eve first. And really, just think about it. Adam and Eve knew what it was like to be in close fellowship with God, to be face to face with God, to have free access into His presence. And, and they would have no, and they experienced that blessed life that was associated with living so closely with God in this intimate relationship, living in that perfect world without any sin or pain or suffering or decay or death. And they knew that it was because of their sin that they forfeited that free access to God and the blessed life that was associated with it. It was precisely because they rebelled and sinned against God and yet, God had been good to them. God didn't zap them to death. He could have done that, and God would have been right and just to do that, because they would simply be getting what they deserved. But instead, God drove them out of the garden for their own good, so that they wouldn't be locked in that sinful state forever, so that they wouldn't have uh, direct access to the tree of life. And now 
life is tainted by their sin and its consequences and they hold on to this promise that God would bring about a savior who would crush the head of the serpent. And I'm sure many, many, many times Adam and Eve would have told the two boys all that happened and how they are to trust God and, and, how, they are, and how they are not to trust Satan or even their own sinful desires. You know, they would have reminded them time and again how God indeed is good and does only what is good, and does only what is right. And that they are to put their trust and their hope in what God has said, and there is great blessing in it. And there's great joy in it. But to listen to Satan, or to go according to their own sin and their sinful desires, is the path of misery and ruin and pain and ultimate death. They would have probably even told them about how they were lost in sin when they first disobeyed God and they, they had that sin nature. But how God, because of his goodness toward them, transformed them and opened their eyes. And they, they would have been even taught about what God had required as an offering then at appointed times how to approach God now, now that they are outside of the garden. Now they don't have that face-to-face -face free access into this presence. God would have instructed them how they are to approach him now. And so now the children are following suit. So the appointed time has come for the two boys, Cain and Abel, to present an offering to the Lord. Now here's a question. If God manifested his presence in a special way in the garden, and now mankind is barred from the garden with, with the cherubim and the, and the flaming sword, you know, whether it's a whirling fire or strikes of lightning going in every direction, but, but mankind is barred from coming into the presence of God just like that, then where are they to bring their offering to? Because they're barred from, you know, from having that free access to God. So where are they bringing this offering? Because it says they bring the offering to the Lord. See, a few theologians have said that it may well have been at the entrance of the garden that was blocked. And I think this is actually quite possible that this is exactly where they were bringing their offering. Because think about it. We saw, as we looked at the Garden of Eden, that this was on top of the mountain. We saw this in Ezekiel 28, 13 to 14, which connects the Garden of Eden to the, the holy mountain of God. So this garden was on top of a mountain. And then on top of that, so if you think, okay, there's this garden on top, and then this garden, which is on top of the mountain, man is barred from it, and there's, there's fire coming down, or flashes of lightning, or whatever. What comes to mind when you think about it? Perhaps Mount Sinai? Or even more specifically, perhaps the tabernacle, where the cherubim on, on the uh, just before the most holy place. They are on the curtains guarding the most holy place. And the Shekinah glory of God is manifest in that most holy place. And given the many connections between the garden and the temple and the tabernacle as we looked at a few weeks ago, it could well be that they brought their offering at the entrance of the garden. And, and it it most likely would have prefigured the bringing of the offering to the outer courts of the tabernacle, even though the people didn't have access, direct access into the very presence of God, which is shown in the holiest of holies, guarded by the cherubim. So this is very much possible. 
So after an appointed time, or it came time for Cain and Abel to bring their offering to the Lord. There's a specific place that they're coming to. And even the fact that both Cain and Abel are bringing an offering to the Lord at the same time, it further shows that this was not something that they randomly decided to do. Where, you know, Cain just decided, oh, you know what, maybe I'll just go up and give an offering to the Lord. And then somehow, magically, at the same time, Abel also decided, oh, you know what, I might just go and give an offering to the Lord. No, this is something that they were instructed to do in how to worship God. And now both of them are coming to the Lord at the particular appointed time, to a particular place with their individual offerings. Now let's look at the offering that each of them bring. Verse 3 and verse 4. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Now at first glance, it looks like each of them are you know, brought according to the kind of work that they were involved in, and everything seems pretty okay. But as we continue to read verse 4 and verse 5, this is what it says, verse 4 and verse 5. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. God approved or accepted Abel and his offering, but he did not accept Cain and his offering. There was some visible way in which God showed his approval. Some say perhaps fire came down and burnt up the offering that uh, Abel offered, the animal sacrifice that Abel offered, perhaps. Regardless, in some form or the other, God's approval of Abel and his offering and the disapproval of Cain and his sacrifice was made known. But, but why, you might ask, why did God accept one and not accept the other? Well, to understand this, we need to closely examine the offerings and the, and the context and perhaps some other parts of the Bible that tell us something about this event. Now it says, Cain offered an offering of the fruit of the ground. Now there is nothing wrong in of itself uh, with the fruit of the ground. And even later, as we you know, go to Exodus and as the law comes in and things like that, there's things like the grain offering, which is nothing but the fruit of the ground. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Cain was a farmer. He would have worked hard. He would have tilled the ground. He would have watered the crops, uh, getting rid of the weeds and whatnot. And finally, he gets the harvest and he brings some of the produce of the ground to the Lord. So, but, but what's wrong with that? What we need to notice is not so much what is mentioned, but what is not mentioned in the text. It doesn't say that Cain brought the first fruits of the ground. Now, this is, this is important. Because one of the things that we see in the rest of the Old Testament is that God required the, the first fruits and the firstborn of the animals. You say, why? Because it was a way of recognizing that God had provided everything. So that when a person gave their first fruits, it was an act of faith. See, they don't know if they're going to get more produce. Because this was the, the very first bit of their harvest. But they trusted God with it, and, and they trusted Him with it, and so they would give their first pr produce, their first fruits to the Lord, and trusted God with it, and trusted that God would be their provider. So it was a way of living by faith. And essentially, just following the principle that man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's not by bread alone, but man would live, is to live by faith in God's word and trust in him. So giving of the first fruits was a way of ex- expressing faith and even saying, God, you have first place in my life. And so the very first produce, the very first harvest, the first fruits are given to you. I don't know what's coming next, but this is for you, and I'm trusting you with it. But we don't see that in Cain's offering. Cain simply brought some of the fruit of the ground. Now contrast that with the description of Abel's offering. Verse 4. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. See, Abel brings the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. Fat portions were considered the best parts of the animal sacrificed to the Lord. You know, Leviticus 3.16, for example, says, and the priest shall burn them. This is talking about some of the organs and burning them uh, some of the organs of the animal sacrifice, uh, where previously it's talked about, yeah, you take all of that along with its fat. So the priest is saying, and the command is given, so the priest should burn all of it with the fat on the altar as a food offering with a pleasing aroma. All the fat is the Lord's. So so this was some of the choicest parts of the animal uh, sacrifice. So Abel, unlike Cain, brought the best of the best. He, he brought the firstborn of his flock, and, and not just some uh, you know, shriveled up uh, animal, but the, but the best of that uh, firstborn of the flock. And including their fat portions, you know, the, the fatty, chubby uh, firstborn ones. And he trusted God with the rest. Abel gave his best and what came first was given to the Lord. It was an indicator of where his heart was at. The Lord was first in his life. But this was not the case with Cain. Cain simply brought some of the fruit of the ground and it showed that the Lord was not the first place in his life. Now, on the outside, to the human eye, everything would have looked okay. You know, Cain would have looked like he was doing the right thing. But God always sees the heart. 1 Samuel 6, 7 says, The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You know, sometimes people will excuse, uh, you know, will use this to excuse their behavior. You know, they will say things like, oh, you know, God sees my heart. God sees the heart. So it doesn't matter whether I do this or do that or how I do it or whatever. And I think they're, they're entirely missing the point. Yes, God sees the heart, But a heart that is devoted to God and has God as first priority will manifest itself in external behavior, in the way they live their life. For those of you listening, I want to ask you a question. With your time, with your money, with your energy, do you give your best to the Lord? Now, I'm not talking, I'm I'm not saying that all of you should, you know, quit your jobs and just serve the Lord. Now, God may call some of you to do that. It, It is possible. But I'm not talking about that. What I am talking about is this. In the big things, In the small things, in everything you do, 
Do you invest your time and money and energy in such a way that it is all directed to God? Does God come first in all of this? Where you are making much of God in everything that you do. See, this is what true worship of God is. See, if we're not seeking to do this, to to make much of God in how we live our lives, then we're not living a life that honors God and it does not glorify Him. And remember, even as we've been learning through this series in Genesis, whatever is not for the glory of God is also not for our good. Abel gave first place to God. And this is seen in the way that he gave the best that he had to God, the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. Cain, on the other hand, simply brought some of the fruit, and it showed that God didn't have first place in his life. God, or the worship of God, or glorifying God, was just one of the things that he did in his life. He did this, he worked hard and did all these things and, and worshipping God and regarding God was just one thing. It wasn't just his entire life. It wasn't directed to God and God's glory. And so as a result, God rejected Cain and his offering but accepts Abel and his offering. But there's a second reason why God responds differently to the two offerings. And it's the fact that Abel brought a blood sacrifice by killing an innocent animal. You see, Abel not only recognized God for who he is and therefore gave God the first place in his life, but he also recognized that he was a sinner. That that he had this sinful nature and he stood condemned before God. And, and, And because sin deserves death, Abel then killed the firstborn of his flock and brought it to the Lord. Recognizing that an innocent life had to be shed for sin. Without it, he could not approach God. You know, he said, where did Abel get the idea of killing an innocent animal? How would he know that God would require this? remember just last week we saw that instead of killing Adam and Eve for their sin, God killed an innocent animal in their place and clothed their sin and shame and guilt. And we saw how it served as a reminder of the seriousness of their sin and the price that had to be paid for their sin, which is nothing but the blood of an innocent life. And so his parents would have taught him that as well. That because of sin, to approach God, your sins need to be covered. An innocent animal has to be sacrificed. And that is exactly what Abel does here. But aside from that immediate context of what God has just done and showed uh, to Adam and Eve we get some more clues about why it was necessary that Abel was to kill an animal and bring it before God as we look at the New Testament. Look at Hebrews 11.4. It was part of our morning Bible reading. Hebrews 11.4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. So here we see the big issue was his faith. Abel had faith. 
And by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice. But you say, what is the better sacrifice? Well, just turn over to the next chapter and look at what Hebrews 12, 24 says. And it gives us some more clue as to why Abel's sacrifice was a better sacrifice. Hebrews 12, 24 says, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See, here the author of Hebrews is comparing two sacrifices. The sprinkling of Jesus' blood and the sprinkling of Abel's sacrifice, the blood that he shed from that animal sacrifice. And, and so when you look at the context and everything else that's been said here, it's talking about the fact that Jesus' blood sacrifice is greater. Why? Because it can actually forgive people of their sins. Versus Abel's blood sacrifice couldn't actually save people of their sins because it was pointing to that greater reality. So long as the person had faith in God, that God would do that, that's how they were accepted. Because that's the whole point of Hebrews 2, right? Even before it says, no blood of goats or bulls can ever atone for sins. So what is the implication then in Hebrews 12? That the reason why Cain, pardon me, Abel offered a blood sacrifice was for forgiveness of sins. Even though the greater sacrifice, the greater sprinkling of blood was Jesus because his actually accomplished forgiveness of sins. So you see, when you think about that, and then you come and think, so why is there shedding of blood? Why is there killing of an animal? Why did Abel do that? Because he recognized his sin. Because he's rec- recognized he's unworthy of God's goodness toward him. So he comes to God, giving God the best and his firstborn and its fat portions, knowing that without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And then he's trusting God that God would ultimately provide that deliverer that he has promised. So Abel is ultimately trusting in God and and trusting in Jesus, the promise that Jesus would come and make things right and would deliver them. But what about Cain? See, Cain worked hard in the field probably even more than Abel. Because he had to till the ground and water the seeds and and make it grow and pull out the weeds and then harvest. It was a lot of work. And so what Cain brings before the Lord is his, he says, this is my hard work. See, he thought by his own efforts, in his own way, he could somehow make things right with God. God, here's my, here's my hard-earned effort, and I'm going to bring that to you, and now let's make this right between us. But he had no faith in God. He had no love for God. He was blind to his own sin and, uh, you know, next week we'll see even more how blind he is to his sin as we look at the following verses. Cain is simply trusting in his own efforts and he brings that to God. And that's why at the end of verse 5 it says, So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Because Cain is thinking, all this effort, and I brought this, and God rejects this? How dare he? And he's angry. He's angry at God. See, Adam and Eve, remember, when they were lost in their sin, after they ate that forbidden fruit, 
what did they do? They tried to cover their guilt and their shame by covering themselves with fig leaves. Remember, just making loincloths out of fig leaves? And yet, that was of no avail. Now, Cain, who is also dead in sin, he thinks by great effort, somehow he can be right with God. But really, all he's doing is he's trusting in his own efforts. And this is the way of the world too, right? As they try to approach God in their sin. They try to do good works. And think that as a result that they would have, they will have a right relationship with God. They'll point at all their good works. Look, this, 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 this. Therefore, I'll be okay with God. I'm not that bad a person. See, God hates such good works. In fact, he calls them polluted garments or filthy rags, according to Isaiah 64, 6. And that's why when you come to the New Testament, in in Romans 3, verse 12, it says, there is no one who does good, not even one. See, because it's saying that there is no one who is lost and is dead in sin who does good that is pleasing in God's sight. There is no one who does good in their sinful state that, is, that will be acceptable in God's sight. No, God detests it. It's filthy rags as far as God is concerned. No amount of good works, no amount of attending church or listening to sermons or going to a Bible study or even verbally acknowledging the fact that you believe in God or believe in Jesus can make anyone right with God. All of these things are good things, but none of these things in itself can make a person right with God unless the person recognizes their sin before God. That they don't deserve anything but the just wrath of God. But God in his mercy and his grace has sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect spotless lamb of God, the sinless one who came to die as a sacrifice for sinful people like you and me. And that is the only reason, Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his resurrection, that is the only reason anyone can be made right with God. And if, you, if there's somebody here who now says, oh, oh I believe in this, I've, I've put my full hope and trust in Jesus now, then I would say your life needs to display that reality. You say, How? By making much of Jesus. By turning away from your sin each day and making much of Jesus. By showing that Jesus is first place in your life, just like Abel. That is the evidence that somebody has put their full trust and hope in Jesus. This is the evidence that a person is in right relationship with God. This is the evidence that a person is truly a Christian. It is not simply external behavior. It is not simply some verbal confession. It has to be translated into the life that a person lives if that person truly believes. I wonder if there's anyone here listening who hasn't put their trust in Jesus. We'd love to talk to you about Jesus. We'd love to talk to you more about this. You can email us at connect at gracebiblechurch.org.au and we'd love to talk to you about it. Or perhaps if you know some of the members of our church, you can even speak to them in terms of you know, what it means to follow Jesus. But don't delay For those of you who are believers and have put your full trust in Jesus, let me encourage you as I'm encouraging myself with these words. 
let us continue to recognize our unworthiness. Now, God didn't have to do this. But by his grace and mercy, he has done this for us. And so let us then turn away from our sin and, our, and put our trust and hope in Jesus, making much of Jesus in everything that we do so that he would have the first place. And that way we are honoring him and glorifying him for all the world to see. And really showing that, yeah, this is exactly how you know that I am a child of God. I just want to end by saying this. It is a privilege to live for God and to make much of Jesus. It's the only reason we can be acceptable in God's sight. But beyond that, it is really a privilege because it is not something we deserve. And so let us, as children of God, be busy about making much of this great and wonderful God who came in the form of Jesus Christ and make much of him through everything that we do for the world to see and ultimately give glory to God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for opening our eyes to yourself. What we deserved is damnation. And yet, Father, we thank you that you opened our eyes to yourself. And we thank you for your grace and your mercy shown to us this way. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know that without Christ, we would be lost in sin and there would be no remedy. And so, Father, even recognizing this, even recognizing your goodness toward us in this, help us each day as your children to make much of Jesus, to keep running to Jesus, to keep running away from our sin and live for him and not be ashamed of him. And Father, if there's anyone here listening today and have not put their trust in Jesus, would you use these words to, uh, by our Holy Spirit to break down their stone-cold hearts? Father, we pray that they would repent and humble themselves before you and submit to the good and wonderful God you are. Father, we thank you for all that you have done in our lives and all that you're doing. And to you and you alone, we give you glory. And we pray in the matchless name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.